this thing on? Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm Keith Elwin, the lead designer for JAWS. To my right is the lead mechanical engineer, actually the only mechanical engineer on JAWS, I believe, Harrison Drake. Uh, to my left, Rick Nagel, uh, my seemingly personal programmer of all my games. Uh, we've worked on everything together except uh, Bond 60th. Uh, to his left, the famous uh, Hall of Famer Jerry Thompson, who has done all my games, including Bond 60th. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have our new hire, our rookie, uh, Elizabeth Gieske came on, uh, what, last summer? Yeah, last summer, got her feet wet with us, and uh, now she's a, she's a hotshot programmer. Way too good for us now, but uh, I'm, you'll be seeing way more from her in the future, I believe. And then we had uh, one of our AV artists, uh, David Liskovec, who um, specifically worked on the 3D video mode which is a first in pinball. All right. Sorry, I don't need to. Yes. So whenever I'm given a new project to do, uh, the first thing I do is I, I have a notebook for every game. And this is page one. Of, uh, I didn't write the total date, but in t sometime in 2022, I grabbed this notebook. Vertigo was the code name for JAWS. And then how I design, I just start writing down ideas. I watched all the JAWS movies, including four, which was torture. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, one page of probably 20 pages of notes I took. You know, what, what's happening where, you know, th things we can actually use, and, you know, if we use a mode out of here. So I have pages and pages of notes I took uh, during each movie. So from there, I, uh, I start sketching in my brain, okay, you know, what are some things I want to do here? So I'm drawing notes here of, okay, I, the fish finder, because, you know, we're on Hooper's boat. You know, I've got to have that somewhere, so I, I put some drop targets there, I put some inserts in front of it. At one time, I originally envisioned uh, spelling out shark on the play field. Uh, just, you know, hey, that'd be cool to have a little spell out there. And and then you can see, probably you can see, is, uh, is I have some shot ideas. Uh, the boat on the right side, I figured, hey, it'd be cool to have a little bash boat. And then uh, I have the little uh, figure eight shot with the reel, which I... Uh, later used on Bond's 60th, even though I technically designed it here first. Uh, I had an idea for the upper play field being the orca with a little shark cage hanging off of it that, you know, we'll have a little dummy inside there that is kind of our bash toy. And so that's kind of how uh, I envisioned kind of like the main uh, things in the game. You can see the shark fin there, the little pop-up shark fin. And so then uh, I started catting. And this is kind of a the many iterations of uh, the CAD work through the, the design cycle. As you can see, the, um, yeah, you can go back. So when I first start, uh, I don't have, you know, I don't bother with inserts in the CAD because uh, you're just gonna be moving around, moving around. Um, I had kind of a rough idea of the upper play field and I had this ramp in my head, I had this ramp that came down and did this cool helix uh, to the lower play field and you know, I really wanted that in there. And as you can see, as the further we go to the right as the game progressed, and Harrison's like, no, nope, that's not happening. There's no room. Glass. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, the light don't have glass, but man, when you try to put a glass on something, it's, uh, everything has to fit under it, which sucks as a game designer. <laughs> and then uh, we kind of, you know, just kind of evolved. It, not a whole lot changed on this layout, especially with the upper play field. That was pretty much there the whole time. Uh, the main thing that changed a lot was our, our center toy. Uh, as you probably heard, there was once a ball-eating shark in there, which I think we have some video of. Is that true? Yep. We have, yeah, we have a placeholder. So there's our, uh, I went to Target, I bought a little uh, Jaws kit, and it had a, a shark cage with a guy in it, and I was like, this, you know, I told Harrison, yeah, it would be really cool if we can just lock a ball on here and then use it as a bash toy, and 
And again, Harris has said, yeah, you're dreaming. So uh, uh, yeah, that kind of evolved. Well, what else can I use? So you know, I went back and rewatched the movie. And uh, what's on the back of the book? Well, it's the chum bucket. So uh, that's how that evolved. And you can see my sense of humor. I put little uh, googly eyes on the chum bucket on the uh, picture on the right. So then we get to the, uh, the center toy. Uh, we kind of had the idea, OK, we're going to have the shark come up from under a boat. And so we originally designed the, um, it's kind of more of a bash boat with it, more of a very target. And we, we tested it, and we're like, oh, this is not fun. And here's a video. A super slow video. So we, we tested that. We shot it for a while, and we were like, yeah, this isn't that fun. And what if the shark kind of came up from under the boat, you know, kind of jumped out and scared the person? So uh, we went with uh, option B, and that would be Ben Gardner's boat, which is what we uh, ended up with. And we put a little Easter egg of a Ben Gardner's head hiding under the uh, captive ball there. And we have our little uh, our Quince Shack. Uh, that's the prototype that just says Game Rule 1, Game Rule 2, Game Rule 3. Because I had no idea what we were doing with it, but other than, you know, really wanted that on there. And then uh, our first little 3D printed prototype of the Pro of what we were going to fill that space with. A little shark cage, which actually came out pretty cool. I was skeptical. I think we all were, but, you know, we were happy with how that ended up looking. Oh yeah, here we go. Video, our concept video of the Finmac. As you can see, um, we originally had it actually fin shaped, and if you watch the video on the right, you'll s you'll see why we uh, abandoned that in slow motion. Boom. So yeah, so we were actually having shots airball into the upper play field off the uh, the anatomically correct fin shape, and we decided, yeah, that's got to go. And so then we uh, switched to the uh, the carbon fiber kind of standard uh, target size that uh, you ended up seeing on the game. And these are uh, this is footage of us actually testing this target for what was it three months? Yeah, three months. Anything you want to say about this video? Um, we got to, yeah. Yeah, so we ended up getting to one and a half million hits on the carbon fiber parts and just decided to cut it there. It was clearly not going to fail at that level. So, but uh, yeah, this thing ran about three months continuously without without fault, pretty much. We, we called it at that. Yeah, still to this day, I have not heard of uh, any carbon fiber failure. Now we get to the exciting stuff, stuff that nobody has seen before. What you see here is a uh, taken to almost completion uh, original uh, pro package. Artist Michael Barnard uh, gave us a few different art packages. And this is one of the ones we didn't like the entire package, most noticeably the, uh, the Translite. Uh, we just felt it was kind of lacking and then we decided well we'll just uh we'll just not use it. Yeah, these these are actually the premium uh, back box sides as well. Um, yeah, so we we basically pieced together all his his little concept pitches to us and made the packages that we wanted. And I believe did this is Yeah, this this, this is, is premium. premium. It pretty much shipped as is except the original Pro back boxes got moved over to the premium and the premium ones went over to the Pro. And I think, uh, so if you see, the, uh, the buoy has different art. There's one fin and one hand. And I don't actually remember which one we used. But one of those is uh, unused. This is, this is the exciting one. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, this is the one. Uh, I remember the entire team was sitting in, a, in the art meeting, and... He showed us this, and he's like, wow, that, that sunset, that's really cool. Uh, that guy on the side of the cabinet behind the girl is really, he looks like a caveman, kind of <laughs> floating in the water. We were it's like, what, what's going on there? And uh, yeah, we decided just to cut the whole sunset uh, 
vibe out altogether, just because it just really didn't match the rest of the game. And this is uh, that w this was after we removed the dude from the left side. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the first <laughs> thing to go was the, the the floaty dude on the left side, and then uh, so Michael came back with uh, some you know different sides for us, and then like I said, all together we ended up just cutting the whole sunset vibe out. And this was the, I think this is what the pro with the uh, accessory armor, or is this? Yeah. So this was the uh, um, a basically complete redo, the upper half of the art package, um, for for the LE edition to get rid of that sunset. Um, one of the only actors we had rights for was Richard Dreyfus, uh, so this became very Richard Dreyfus heavy on the art, uh, which is part of the reason it didn't ship like this. Uh, but this is what turned into the LE. Yeah, okay. Here's some very, very early uh, Michael Barnard sketches. Uh, you can see the uh, inserts are, are a bit different at this point. Um, but I, I knew from the beginning I wanted the, you know, the, the famous shark you know, coming out of the water at the, like between the flippers can... I think we originally had him eating the uh, the shoot again insert, but then we decided, nah, that was kind of weird, so we just kind of moved it to his jaw. And one thing we noticed that if you take the Game of Thrones uh, the shield inserts and flip them upside down, it looks just like the Jaws logo. So uh, that's what we ended up doing for the uh, all those different shark inserts. Yeah, I think they were they were actually boats with wakes yeah. at one point to be the the shot the shot lines in the art. Yeah, that's right. That didn't live long though. Or uh, license or concept set, uh, sketches for the orca. Uh, I I wanted my, from day one. I wanted the orca upper play field, and it's just I wanted the entire boat, and that was just proven to be too difficult. It's narrow, obviously as narrow as a boat gets. So we figured we'll just cut it in half, and then you have to use your imagination past the uh, the bridge there. But yeah. this is what we pitched the licensor. They they loved it, and this the upper like the upper play field was. Uh, Pretty much one and done early on. Yeah, the initial upper playfield you showed me actually was turned 180. Yeah. So it kind of had this Titanic, you know. You yeah. Know, Titanic look to the. <laughs> instead of the little dump out on the uh, left, you would kind of like walk the plank, or whatever. You know, it's kind of down the middle, but um, that ended up interfering with ramps. So we yeah. kind of just made that short little funnel out of there. Here's the full color render of uh, our licensing submission, including the uh, the billboard in the Clint Shack. All right, so this next one. <laughs> There's a so people ask about toppers. Okay. This was, you know, very, very early on. I was like, oh, it would be cool to have this LCD back panel or just a million, you know, RGB lights behind, you know, the shark sculpt. Who was, he's going after this dude. And you can see my original sketch of uh, what I was going for. And then... Uh, I said, Harrison, yeah, why don't we just concept this and see what it looks like? And then. So, has anyone noticed in the game manual that there's two toppers listed? This is the other topper. or No, this is not the, this one. Well, it's not. It's similar. Yeah. This actually had four different versions at one point. Yeah, this is. This, this, yeah, I, I asked Harrison, "What's with these weird feet?" And he's, "Oh, it's just placeholder." You know, it's just, well, yeah, well, we all we all stood around and looked in, at. In that. my defense, you have feet in your <laughs> sketch up here. <laughs> yeah, sketch is not cat. So there's a guy that modded the legs on the Mecha Godzilla for the playfield. I was really hoping somebody would mod a torso onto this topper to complete the human. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the the shark attack topper that uh, ended up in our manual that everyone uh, was asking about. So basically, this is 100% based on the Universal Studios Jaws the Ride, where I mean I forgot this guy's name, but you know he's the guy, the fisherman in the boat that you know the Jaws comes up and he just kind of knocks the boat, waves around. And we we pitched this topper to Universal and they're like, no. <laughs> uh, but by then it already, because this is kind of late in the process, it already uh, making its way in the manual that we might be doing this. So that's how we ended up with the uh, the Phantom Second Topper. And as you can see, yeah, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't great. Yeah. So, yeah. so meanwhile, meanwhile, knowing we were kind of struggling with concepts 
on the, the shark attack one. Um, there was the, the billboard topper kind of stewing in the background just and as a, a backup plan. By the way, this, this was all Harrison. It was really cheap at the beginning. No one was buying this. <laughs> Harrison's uh, philosophy was if we don't do it, someone else will. So he just had kind of this, you know, twenty dollar printout of the the billboard. <laughs> like, no, we can do. Wrong. We can do better than that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it you know, originally it was unlit. Um, you know, then it was uh, more it needs to do more, more, right? Um, so we ended up going more 3D, doing the full metal structure, um, and then eventually this was like basically the last iteration before it got fully lit with the uplighting. Um, and uh, Rick, Rick and company did a really nice job with the sunset time of day light shows on this, uh, on the shipping version. Yeah, the light shows, if anyone who has one can tell you how cool those light shows are. If you're playing the 8-bit mode and a police boat shows up, you see like the police light reflecting off the, uh, the billboard. It's really cool. Uh, so our uh, video mode started off as a concept in my head. After, you know, everybody's familiar with uh, the killer shark from the movie and the uh, the famous Sega game. So I was like, we, we got to do this. So I was thinking, you know, what's, what's everyone's favorite video mode? You know, it's fishtails. It's simple, stupid, fun. And I was like, well, we'll just do that, but we'll have, you know, sharks instead. And, you know, the sharks will be coming at you. There'll be kind of other things to shoot. And uh, we kind of just concepted a few uh, ideas. Uh, it was kind of boring because originally you can only shoot forward so I said Rick hey can we shoot in different directions and then um, that's how we ended up wh where we did which is much better than what it started off as but uh, the biggest part obviously was the 3D which had never been attempted by any of us and uh, David here you want to take it away yeah so um, did I get this right so uh Originally, I actually uh, wasn't sure if we were going to do the 3D mode. Uh, they had uh, we had completed the 2D one initially, and then later on they were just like, "Hey, can um, because of the uh, Jaws all did the 3D movie back in the 80s, so they uh, decided, hey, can you do a little test?" And uh, I originally just did it with uh, one of the gray white models that we had, and uh, I wasn't really sure how it was going to go forward. And then eventually they said, yeah, we just ordered like a couple thousand glasses for all the machines. So I was like, well, <laughs> shit, I got to figure out how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I guess to explain how these glasses actually work. So you essentially take um, one image and you offset it slightly. Um, and you take a picture at two different angles. And then one image, you uh, remove all the red information. The other one, you remove all the green and the blue. And then when you put on the glasses, if you actually wink, you will see one image and the other one is black and then vice versa when you switch it. So what ends up happening is as you move, your two eyes will triangulate it and basically confuse your brain. And it'll create like the uh, parallax illusion. Um, for the arcade I, uh, cabinet itself, uh, someone on Pinside actually did a really good um, uh, restoration of the original Killer Shark arcade game and had some wonderful reference pictures. So I used all of those when I um, and I tried to make the uh, the arcade machine that you see in the beginning of, uh, as authentic as I can to the original, uh, including all the cheesy animations. Uh, we even put the flickering in in the non 2D mode. I wasn't sure if we'll keep that in, but uh, we ended up removing it uh, for the 3D mode because having those glasses on anyway gives you a headache. Working on it was <laughs> kind of funny because you just wear it for so long. Eventually, when you take it off, you get a headache too. So. Uh, and then since I wear glasses too, I did a bunch of things where I'm just like, you know, it looks better if I have the 3D glasses on first with my glasses over it. It just, it, I just made myself look ridiculous. But uh, it was a lot of fun to work on. Um, and yeah, I have to thank uh, Mitch a lot. He was the programmer who worked on me, worked with me on this mode. Uh, he was wonderful to work with. And uh, yeah, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, it's no joke. Uh, him and Zach Stark, the, the lead animator, they would work till like seven o'clock at night and they had these 3D glasses on and at the beginning of the project, they're all, oh, this is awesome, this is fun, we're learning so much. And then I think after a month, they're like, let's never do this again. Yeah, once we, <laughs> once, uh, so the, uh, typically with the art on our end is we're giving um, MP4s to people, which is just a prepackaged video. So with this one, what was different is we had to put this all in kind of like our, rec our radium engine, which is basically like flash, you can say. And I was a little worried because we had all these frames of animation and then they keep, kept on wanting to add sharks and like 
pinballs and divers and stuff, and I was getting worried about the performance, but like I said, Mitch works, worked it out great, and uh, yeah, everything worked out really good. So I'm really hoping Zoom adds 3D meetings at some point, because the day that uh, the glasses showed up was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can see how excited Mitch was there. Jaws the Revenge. Uh, so this was an idea I had to take an existing game, take the existing layout, all the shots, all the inserts, and make a completely different game out of it. And this is something I've been wanting to do for a while. You know, I've experimented with making challenge modes, which are fun, but they're usually just, you know, a modification of an existing uh, wizard mode or something. So I really wanted to take just take it to the next level. This will be something that you have to, you know, sign on to IC to earn teeth. That way you're just not playing it 24-7. You actually have to earn, um, you know, tokens, as it were, to play it, what we call the shark teeth. So it started off as, you know, everyone was like, well, yeah, you should look at the, the 8-bit Jaws game in, uh, in Nintendo. So I was like, okay. So I went on YouTube and I was, I was looking at that. And I was like, wow, that looks awful. Um, and I was like, well, and, you know, I kind of like the looks of it. Well, uh, We'll just wing it, and uh, we started uh, the art team just making art without really actually knowing what we were going to do. Um, and then they gave it to Rick, and Rick put it in this little video. This kind of shows every single frame of uh, everything in there. Yeah. <coughs> um, so, yeah, this is uh, basically when they hand off the art. They make it in the Flash engine, and then, um, and then they, sh they basically give it to us uh, as a package, and then we put it in the game. And so this is a video that I took when I first put it in the game, just to see all the animation as a test. Um, so from here, we have to take it and basically make all the lanes do everything that all the shots are doing on the play field. So basically, you can see all the animation frames here, but um, we have to make it in sync with what's happening on the play field. So um, you see you have like the five lanes for all the five shots, but you can put basically any swimmer, beachgoer, um, police boat, fishing boat on any of the lanes. So basically that's where the code comes in. You have to basically weave all the code in there and make it do what the mode's doing. Um, yeah, we, we spent way more time than we should have doing this thing. Uh, it just it just wasn't fun because uh, it was kind of late in the production that we were getting. We we had to release you know get the game playable, get the game fun, and then we'll we'll just keep working on this. We'll just keep pecking away, at making it fun, and then we had kind of made some promises that hey, this will be out you know during the summer, you know when Fourth of July, everyone's gonna love it. And so then uh, we kind of just had to hunker down and focus on it. It was. It was it was fun. I'm really glad the way it turned out, but it was it was really bad for a while. And because we it, it was you were hitting the action button, you're like, oh, this is kind of unique and original. And but we weren't really doing much with the ball and the flippers. So we started, okay, what if we you know add make every stage a multi ball? And then that, that was a little too much. And then so we got the idea. It's like, well, what if you start with one ball? You kind of get used to the mode, get used to using the action buttons, swimming at different beaches, chomping on beach goers. And then it just gets harder and harder by adding uh, more balls every stage. And that, that was kind of the magic formula for that mode. And we literally, two weeks before it released, we, we tested it that way. And thank goodness, because like I said, everyone would have been bored of it after a couple of plays. And uh, thankfully, it worked out, I hope. So yeah, so for the LCD, so for this game, you know, we had the movie clips. So basically, uh, Keith had a few ideas for some awards that they didn't have movie clips for. So we had um, Patrick O'Connor help us out creating any of the non, like, realistic uh, video clips you see was made by him in Blender. Uh, he did an awesome job. Um, the whole um, score area with the shark fin going across. I'm pretty sure that was done by Keith with just like a Sharpie um, sh telling us like, hey, just something <laughs> like this. And it, it ends up working out really good. Uh, we want to do a thing where we keep the score in a consistent spot. And then for the match, actually, um, each can is actually labeled off of someone. So each person here, Harrison has one, Keith has one. So um, yeah, uh, Phil did this for us. So he uh, custom made our match animation for, yep. And then, uh, yeah. 
this is an example of uh, the one of the renders that Patrick did to kind of show if this is the process of him. So this is, I believe, is the before you shark this shark encounter. Yeah, he did an amazing job. Yes, he did very good. You guys are going to like this next one. Yeah, here's some ice damage time. <laughs> Sometimes we put temporary art in uh, just so, so just uh, for people to hook up. So, <laughs> In case you're wondering, hey, this looks familiar. It's like, yes, it's the Hand of Fate from Elvira that we had to kind of shoehorn in there just yeah. at release because uh, Rick didn't have time to make his own you know, how are we going to do it? So we threw this in there. And of course, you know, we streamed that in day one. And we're like, wow, that looks awful. And I was like, yes, it's, it's sorry. It's temporary. Yes, don't worry. It's the uh, wheel of bait. So. <laughs> Hand of bait. Back to uh, uh, designing games. So I will usually, if I have to fly anywhere or go on a trip, I always bring my notebooks with me because that's you're kind of confined in an airplane. That's like the best time to think of rules. So... You know, I'm just jotting down all this stuff. I have so many notebooks of random games with rules, and then I'll go back and put them in a Google Doc or talk to Rick and just see, hey, can we do this? Can we do that? And um, and this was kind of towards uh, the end before our first Whitewood. You know, this is where I'm trying to figure out what inserts I need for the fish finder and what each insert's going to do. And it's it's kind of a, a fun, you know, puzzle figuring out, you know, what you need, where are you going to put it? Because sometimes we, we, you know, we have to meet a deadline, so we just start putting inserts and then figure out what we're going to do with it later. But it's always ideal to kind of have, um, to know exactly what you're going to do with each insert. So that's Geese Geese. Yes, program. this is me. Hello. Um, okay, so this is the software portion. And I get the question of what does your daily, um, like, what, what does your day look like? And it's a lot of this. So um, Keith, with all of his put together notes, and here's me with my scattered brained ideas and notes here and there. So um, yeah, here we have like the bottom left has like causes of death. There's like some binary math in there. Um, I score balance the whole game. So there's a lot of just little calculations for what I want the increments to be. Um, the number 28 was super important. Didn't want to forget about that one. 123, I don't know. I have no idea what that stuff says, but. If you go back one more, sorry. Um, I took a screenshot of something I see almost every day, which is Keith and Rick typing at the same time, and <laughs> which is kind of scary. <laughs> um, but we, we go back and forth all the time. I'm fully remote, so I took a lot of videos and screenshots, and we communicated through Slack mostly. And then um, dealing with bugs and crashes were the um, scariest thing. So sometimes our testers would come in and say, uh, the game crashed, and I'm like, okay, what happened? And they're like, I hit the reel. And I'm like, what else? That's it. That's all I get, the reel. Okay, so I'm in, I'm like, well, let's see what happens if some beachgoers were on there. Nope, nothing happened. Um, okay, it was the bounty hunt lit, try that. Okay, this crashed, but only for player two. That's kind of weird. Um, and we finally found that one. That took forever. Okay, now next. All right, so that's an um, example of what I'm looking at. So I have a white wood. We have the actual cabinet. Um, with the play field in there, and we hook it up to our um, Linux boxes, and we can uh, code kind of live and pause the game where we want it and jump to the wizard mode or whatever and code that way. And then we just do a lot of iterative testing. So these are some screenshots of just like, that didn't turn out quite right. So we have the, um, the fish finder total with some tiny text, and um, I have a, a math problem on Quinn's challenge. Let's see here. Um, it says 100 million plus 20. <laughs> 20 um, uh, go back one, go back one, not that one. 100 million plus 20 million times 3, which is not 60 million and 100. So um, that was my bad. And whatever. Okay, next screen. Okay, I get scoring bugs all the time. And oh my goodness, I saw this one at some point, and that one was really scary. <laughs> so we started at 1.4 billion, and we hit the reel. And then we ended with three billion, yay, from one hit. So uh, you don't hear the audio, but it's me just being super annoyed. Um, and then, yeah, luckily those other two didn't make it into the actual production of the game because that crashed the game. You can't have that big of a score, guys. I'm sorry. But, okay. Um, okay, yeah, this is examples of some timers. Uh, so there's timers all throughout the game. Um, the wave ramp trick shot is a timer because there's no switch there, so we have to figure out how long it takes for the ball 
to not go all the way up to the play field, but also not go back down over the switch and then boom, we have we have a trick shot. Um, the out lane ball, ball save, if you hit the post, that's a timer because the gate's not a switch, so we just have to figure out like how long the ball travels. Um, the uh, Probably if you played Jaws in the very beginning, you might have gotten the boat or the ball gets stuck under the boat, which totally stings. You have to wait for the ball search. So I went in to, uh, like in secret at one point, and I was like, I'm going to fix this. So I had to figure out this timer way, because we didn't have a switch to sense if the ball was under the boat. So if the boat was falling at a certain point, it was unsafe for the ball to um, hit the shark. So I had to like kind of calculate how long that would take. Um, and now it works pretty well. Like if you if the ball gets stuck under the boat, like tell me. But I, I think I think I nailed it. Okay, so this was the first time I was trying to do flip lock. So the pic the video on the left was my very very first attempt, and you can't hear it, but my uh, the audio at the end I'm like easy, and I sent it to Keith and I'm like nailed it, and he was like that's not what I was exactly uh, picturing. So I was like oh okay, so like five hours later, and I'm like okay. Take two. This one was easy too. Not really, but um, so that one you have to hold in the button and then hit the action button. And this was taken on one foot, by the way, because I had to hold the camera and I had to um, flip the flipper with my foot. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I live alone and I'm like, oh, great, you got to get this going. I got to send it to Keith. I did it. Um, but throughout all of this time of playing with one hand and one foot, I'm like, I should probably write some mode where I'm forcing the player to do that. So mm -hmm. that's where the broken shark topper mode kind of stemmed from. But OK, next one. And then after a while, um, the flip lock became like a really cool thing in the game. Um, but it was annoying if you accidentally got two balls to get caught in there. And be really cool if like the flipper could just like flip that out for you and keep the other one staged. So um, I quickly did some code stuff and see if it worked. And it worked first try actually. I was like really, really, really happy. And then it didn't work second try. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to do a little bit more tweaking on that. Um, but it, honestly, the, the flip lock was probably the easiest thing to do in the game. The hardest being anything on the display. I stink at displays. Thank you, Rick, for picking my slack up for that one. <laughs> but yeah, it worked out really good. Mr. Dreyfus. <laughs> yeah, you should talk about that since you went out there to L.A. for that. Yeah, so this was from uh, his L.A. recording studio. Uh, it was, well, I don't know, it was actually uh, San Diego, but um, uh, it was interesting. He was uh, had a pickleball injury and was very medicated and uh, <laughs> <laughs> spoke his mind, uh, but he was great to work with. Uh, he just said, well, how do you want it? How do you want it? And, um, and that the engineer, I, I, I don't know, I think he was a friend of yours, the, the guy that recorded him, right? Mm, no, no, I think Jody maybe. Oh, uh, maybe yeah. the friend of Jody's. Yeah. So uh, he had his own engineer kind of record and edit everything before we handed it off to Jerry. Um, but he was really funny to work with. He brought in donuts, and his wife said, "Oh, he he only drinks Diet Dr Pepper, so please have ample amount of Diet Dr Pepper if he's going to be recording lines." And uh, so you know, he got through his lines. He did each one a few times, and then I just remember he got to the end, and he's like, "Is this it?" And he's like. And we're like, yeah, that's good. And he's like, yippee. <laughs> and we actually we got that on uh, on recording. And, and it's one of the, the flipper button uh, call outs when you hit it. That's that's him being excited. Uh, uh, he was finished. All right, who's with our eight bit? Um, well, so um, let well let's talk about the other first. Um, so Universal has been really great to work with. We did uh, Jurassic Park, and they gave us all the dinosaur sounds from the movie. And so on Jaws, um, they gave us individual tracks of the dialogue, the sound effects, and we couldn't use the music tracks because we licensed separate music. Um, but y so Keith had already recorded the Richard Dreyfuss session before he um, got me involved. And he's like, here's your Richard Dreyfuss voice work. And we got a bunch of John Williams songs. And I was like, well, I'm OK. I'm half done. So. Um, then uh, we, uh, we started digging into the movie, and that was the most interesting thing to me because there are lots of things that you don't hear or um, like on dialogue tracks, 
it's a it's a typical thing to re-record some of the vi- the speech in a studio later, but I could actually hear it. So they would be on the boat, and you'd hear the outside. You could tell it was, and then it would jump to a studio where you could hear it. So with all the yelling when they were pulling the you know the line and everything, they were yelling at each other in a recording studio. So uh, stuff like and Harrison's got a clip here. Uh, there's a um, like when they're heading out to sea. Um, and Quint is singing, and you hear the boat noise, and the music starts to swell. You don't hear everything, but um, since we have the isolated dialogue, oh, yeah, oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, and a bottle of rum, fifteen men on the dead woman's bum. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't get all that if you watch the movie. <laughs> So, uh, and then so later, you know, Keith is like, we're going to do this 8-bit mode. We had already done the 3D video mode, and that was super cool. And on that, we took the theme song and kind of EQ'd it to make it sound 70s lo-fi. And um, I said, for the 8-bit mode, I really want to do some 8-bit stuff. And um, he said, okay, well, see what you can do. So I found this young 8-bit enthusiast in South America. I heard some of the stuff he had done. And so I reached out to him and said, can you do a Jaws theme in 8-bit for me? And then we tried that, and Harrison's got a tiny clip of it. This annoyed me really quick. (laughs) That was where I was going next. So Keith goes, yeah, just I, I can't take this over and over. So I said, okay, so I asked the guy to do another piece that we had licensed from John Williams, uh, his version of that. So at that point, Keith's liking it better, and and because um, I, I asked Rick for, I was like, what's this? What's the story on this? I haven't heard back from Keith. He's like, I don't think he really loved it. And I was like, okay, well I, now it's a challenge. I want to make him love it. So um, once he once we got that and he liked it, then he's like, okay, how about some you know some uh, non Jaws tunes? And then we got those done too. And I just love the way the mode came together. Um, yeah, so, it takes, yeah, takes me back to my childhood, and it, that was that. You yeah. did an awesome job on that. And so they, thank you. And then, so they also gave us the sound effects from the movie. So a lot of the sounds you hear in the game are actual sound effects from the movie. So I mean, it's it's it gives it more authenticity and just takes you. My whole thing is being immersed into the theme you're playing, and I hope that you think that we did a good job with that. Uh-uh. Ah. So we actually have a special seventh guest. <laughs> this is this is the only one remaining in the world right now. Yes, this is probably the most expensive toy we could probably even sell. Uh, do you want to explain the why it looks like a potato? Yeah. So you're probably thinking to yourself, Harrison, that's not a shark, that's a potato. <laughs> Uh, and you're probably not far off. Uh, this was so. This was a like a very low low res uh, proof of concept of getting the shark uh, onto a mech. Um, this is actually the first iteration of it, where it only ate one ball. Uh, there was a later one that we'd have no parts remaining from, where it ate two, uh, to kind of do the like oxygen tank, destroy the oxygen tank progression. Um, you know, anyone that's listened to the the Stern podcast knows our thoughts on this thing. Uh, it sucked. It was bad. <laughs> um, very underwhelming when you see it on a game. <laughs> uh, and we probably, to be honest, we probably took this a little bit too far. Um, I mean, there was full 3D models sculpted. Um, you know, the the right side here is me napkinning out, trying to figure out how to get the jaw so it could actually chomp. Um, on things. I think that would have ended up like as a three coil and one motor mech. It was just unruly. But um, yeah, no, at that point, you know, Keith and I looked at this thing and went, yeah, this is terrible. Um, and then started working on the, the Bash Toy version that's on the shipping game. So Yeah, rules wise, it didn't make much sense that he was constantly eating the ball. But okay, then what? Well, he's going to vomit it back out. And it was just, 
I, I knew we would take some heat for it, and it was fine. I think people finally have come to terms with, yeah, this is fine. I, is on that note, so, I think somebody offered me $10,000 to buy this mech on Pinside. So if you're here, <laughs> find me after the seminar. <laughs> we, got, we got a little white van deal going on Yeah. The parking lot. <laughs> All right, we got five minutes. Uh, we can open up for some Q and A. Speed questions. Speed questions. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I I think I probably already know the answer, but I had to ask. Did you send this on to Spielberg? Get any feedback from Spielberg whatsoever? Any involvement at all from him? Uh. The only feedback we got from uh, Spielberg was um, the artwork could only feature Jaws 1 uh, related themes. So he didn't want the, the other Jaws movies featured. And the artwork, he didn't care if we used them you know, in the game as assets, but just the artwork had to be Jaws 1. And that's pretty much the only thing we heard from him. Uh, would you like a... We, uh, we have giveaways. Nothing exciting. If you don't want them, that's fine. Uh, they are CAD printouts. Uh, we have Jaws. We also have uh, some of my other games. Uh, if they're too unwieldy and you don't want them, fine. But if you if you would like one, ask a question. Come on up. We have a bunch. So next question. Yes. Quick question. Quick, quick question. Can you hear this? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I guess it's more to Jerry and to Keith. So when I first heard the game was going to be announced, I was incredibly excited. We know we a lot of the actors are no longer with us. Did you ever consider the son of the of the actor who plays Quint to do his voice in the game? He stars in a Broadway show playing his father, and I thought that might have been. You know, you're shaking your head, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we actually did you work on that? Uh, I yeah, I reached out to him, and I actually saw the play. He was amazing. He looks just like him, but Keith can tell you how the how the Dreyfus came about. Uh, well, he he took too long to get back to us, I think. And then Dreyfus was said, "Yeah, let's let's do it. Let's get it over with." Actually, he, he said he didn't. He, he said no. He said, he he said no. Well, he said no, and then uh, yeah. then he, I think he changed his mind. But it was too. Uh, uh, I don't know. But we had, we had uh, you know all of Robert Shaw's uh, voice work from the the movie, so it wasn't a huge deal to not use him. Uh, it was kind of cool that you know Dreyfus, you know the main star still alive, was actually able and willing to do it. So uh, yeah, it was a call we made. Just go move on with Dreyfus and not. You know, not use uh, his son. Yeah. Yeah, we're just like, yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> uh, hello. Can you share any lessons learned that might be helpful for uh, creation for the next game? Lessons learned? No. Um, uh, I don't think so. Uh, Universal was great to work with, and we've worked with them before. And um, no, it was uh, Jaws came out exactly how I wanted it to be. I kind of wanted, you know, because I'm always known for doing like loops and stuff. And I was like, hey, I'm gonna take a break from that. Um, just kind of make a kind of a similar fan layout. Everyone is gonna be familiar with the shot layout. The shots don't go where you think they are, but you know, you should be comfortable on it. And you know, I get a lot of people saying, thanks, you know, this I love the way this shoots. And that's you know that's important to me is just you know have a fun shooting simple layout with you know rules everyone can understand and I I think this game accomplished that with great assets and music and anyone asked a question if you want to come grab one of these before we run out uh, or find or find us after or find us after I really love the ball save mechanism on the right when you slap the game I was just curious where that idea came from and. And if you think a lot about that kind of sort of extra control mechanism. Yeah, um, I I was a huge fan of uh, the Williams Indiana Jones, you know, when I was a teenager or whenever that came out. And I thought, well, that, that's a great cheap mechanic. And uh, I just kind of shoved everything, made enough room for that to barely fit. And it, and it did. And it was actually it worked too well. So I, I kind of that uh, right outlines like a lot wider than our standard outline. And. So yeah, I, after a couple tests, and we're like, ah, this is this is cool, you know. So yeah, it was definitely inspired by Indiana Jones to answer your question. I went to arcade with a brewery, and um, I was wondering if there was any any collaboration with Narragansett, because I actually had my manager drive all the way to Portland because because we couldn't get in California. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. 
um, there in Ganson, the beer. Well, I, I was wondering if you guys had any collaboration with them, and because the beer thing seems so like, like with the like that was just so cool that like the when Quint was like you know the match. crushing crushing the beer can and we gave away like a skateboard and so I just wonder if you guys had any collaboration or like what what was it that brought that to 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 like you know for that that whole that whole thing so uh you know we just needed a match animation and that was just one of the classic you know Robert Shaw Dreyfus uh, I you know I can do whatever you do better and I thought that would be perfect for a match he's like okay he's doing this and Dreyfus is trying to copy him and uh, yeah we didn't work with them at all because you know they you know, signed the rights away for you know making the movie then we got those assets so we decided to use that and uh, I know a lot of people make homemade toppers out of, out of those cases and that's cool <laughs> uh, great game guys um my question was that the the eight bit mode did you have to run that by universal or or not yeah th it, it, the concept was really early on and uh we had to get sign off on using jaws the revenge because it's yeah. so close to jaws for the revenge or whatever so yeah we had to run out we had to run all that by universal we're running out of time so one more please with this young lady Is it already on? Okay. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, is there any sort of like design process you guys have for your games, specifically Keith? Because uh, when I introduce people to pinball, I always point them towards your games. Um, and I know you're obviously a very qualified player. Um, and so is there any like sort of, um, you know, ways you look at a game to make sure it's fun for newer players as well as very experienced players? Yeah, so obviously that's a problem I have when I design a game is I can't make it for myself. I have to make it for everybody. And in this particular case, Elizabeth was a huge help. She had her and I believe her family uh, playing it and giving me feedback directly uh, while it was in the Whitewood stage. So yeah, I, I, you know, I can make a game for myself that no, absolutely nobody else will understand or like or maybe Usher or two other people, but... Um, it's important to me to kind of throttle, you know, throttle back and say, what's, you know, you look at Deadpool, that, that's what's brilliant about that game. It's so easy to understand. Everything's right in front of you. And I, I try to, you know, ever since Avengers, I've tried to go that route where everything is, you know, right there. Godzilla is the same thing. You can start five different modes doing five different things, and it's all really close to the start button. And so to me, it's important to grab that player early on, and then they'll discover everything else later. Thank you, guys. Why don't you just give these all away?